Hello, my name is Ilir Bechiri. I am a self-taught motion designer living and working in Tirana, Albania. I've been involved for almost 17 years in this industry now, working for different local studios and as a freelance 3D generalist and animator, accumulating a lot of knowledge, tips and tricks and experience along the way. I've made use of several 3D packages in my career, ranging from Lightwave, back in the day, Blender and Cinema 4D. I've also had my fingers dipped into Houdini here and there, but never really used it in any project so far. I don't use Lightwave anymore, still go back to Blender now and then, but I've sticked to Cinema 4D during these past 10 years. Learning is something I constantly do on my spare time and it still gives me a lot of joy to add to my knowledge. More than a year ago I decided to contribute back to the community of Cinema 4D users and knowledge sharers by posting some short and some not so short silent videos containing several techniques as well as quick tips and tricks. I've become fascinated by Espresso, and that's a subject I can talk for hours. This intro is breaking my habit of posting muted videos. As you all know by now, MoGraph is a rock-solid feature of Cinema 4D that has placed it on very high ground in the motion graphics industry. A lesser known feature though, but equally important one, is Espresso, a visual scripting language that enables you not only write simple expressions to drive some attribute in the project you're working on, but also create tools that help you finish that project in less time, with less efforts, without having to know even a single word of code. It's a very convenient thing that Espresso is included into every Cinema 4D version, even that light version that comes bundled with After Effects CC. In this tutorial series I will try to teach you how to set up and rig a 3x3 Rubik's Cube puzzle using pure Espresso in Cinema 4D. I've searched the internet and I've found several attempts at building and animating a Rubik's Cube. I even found some shared Cinema 4D scenes, some of them easy, using keyframe animation, and others more complicated using Python scripting language. But the setup I will show you is both easy and very flexible, making use of Express only. You can animate every move possible, keyframe the moves or if you're an expert on this subject, you can even play and solve it live as the timeline plays forwards or even backwards. This flexibility makes it possible to animate the cube scramble itself or solve itself using the exact moves that you decide. The time for each move is also for you to decide, even double moves. I will show you how to build two important puzzle types, a cube and a pyramid which is slightly more complicated, but very powerful. The setup is very flexible because you can later decide to change the different cubes with other geometry and build other types of puzzles as well, as a lot of interesting motion graphics elements for use in your particular projects. The video is quite long and detailed, so I've decided to divide it into smaller parts that you can more easily follow. Building the Rubik's Cube setup, step by step, I will try to teach you some basic and advanced concepts on Espresso so that you can hopefully use them in your later projects. I will show you how to use the matrices in Espresso to create different types of constraints and manipulate the transformations of objects in your Cinema 4D scene. You will see how I set up a custom timer tool that will work whether the time goes forwards or backwards. I will even make use of it for laying out the UVs of an object and learn a lot about other Espresso nodes. In the beginning I wanted to record a commercial tutorial on the subject, but later I decided to release this one for free for everyone to watch and learn. Of course, finding the right subject, studying, Planning and recording a video tutorial series is something that takes a lot of time and energy. I would make good use of the money and be able to produce other videos on 3D motion design. 
but I thought to myself, what better way to show to an audience of interested people what it is that I'm trying to teach than creating a full training series for free. Maybe later they'll be more interested in buying some of my future training videos on the subject. So this is how it will work. The training is for free, for you to see, learn and share with others. If you find it right in yourself to contribute to other training series like this one, and I already have some of them in mind, you can spend some small money buying this series on Gumroad for a symbolic value in dollars. And bundled with the series of videos, the buyers will also find the scene files for this project and some more examples. Now, this ends up my introduction. I wish you have a good time following this series and learn a lot from it. This is also both an experiment and a new experience for me, so wish me luck too. I will begin by first modeling the cube. There are many ways to do this and the simplest and easiest way to do it is using the MoGraph cloner. But keeping in mind that this tutorial is not to be followed only by people that own the MoGraph module or any version of Cinema 4D that includes it, I will build it in a different way. Follow me. If you want, you can go ahead and build it your own way, but I will suggest you to have a look at this method because you might learn a thing or two. I will first start by creating a cube. I will set its dimensions to 25 centimeters. This is a personal preference. You can use whatever measures you want. I will change the display type to quick shading lines so I can view the outlines of the object too. Enable fillet, fillet radius I will set to 1 and fillet subdivision down to 3. Now I will make this object editable. I will take advantage of the duplicate tool to duplicate the cubes. I will create one copy. The mode will be set to linear. Move in the Y 0, in the X minus 25. I will lock in place this window, select just the cube, add a new transform to the duplicate tool. If I had selected all the objects, the duplicate tool would duplicate everything that it finds selected. So I just selected the original cube and instead of moving it negative 25 centimeters in the x direction, I will move it in the positive direction. So let's select all the objects connect object plus delete. I will add a new transform to the duplicate tool and this time I will copy it along the Y axis. New transform, this time in the positive direction, select all objects, connect objects plus delete. Now we have created the center section of the cube. We'll go ahead and duplicate this once more, this time in the Z direction, select the cube, new transform, negative 25 centimeters, the Z direction. Disable the tool, we don't need it anymore, and unlock the panel. Select all objects and choose connect objects plus delete again. Now it is time to create materials and texture the cube. The normal way of doing it would be to Create a polygon selection out of a set of polygons. Then create a new material, apply to the cube and limit this texture tags influence only to the selected polygons. A cube has six faces and combined with the materials for the rest of the cube, which is the faces that do not have a color, it would have seven materials applied to it and seven materials if you want to limit their influence you would have to create seven different polygon selections one for each material and that would be very messy to look at in the objects manager so i will go ahead and use another method i will undo what we've just done and open two new panels instead, one called 
new texture view. This is where the UVs are laid out. And another panel, UV manager. You would normally think that you don't need a UV for this kind of geometry because a normal Rubik's cube only has colors applied to it, but with this method you can use it to even add textures to whichever of the faces you choose. But another benefit of using this method is to avoid using polygon selections for each of the faces. Watch me and I will explain later why this is a very handy method to use. Now, I will lay out the UVs for each face individually. I will first choose the front face, make a cubic projection of it, and this projects the UVs and uses the whole tile more efficiently. I will go now and do a projection for the right face, the same type of projection, cubic. But what is happening now is that the UVs of these polygons lay on the top of the UVs of the polygons for the front face. Not all of you may know that Cinema 4D uses not just this tile, but the UV coordinates is basically unlimited. What I mean by that is that I can now choose to move these UVs one unit in the X direction and now they do not overlap with the UVs of the front face. I will go ahead and do the same for the set of faces on the left. Do a cubic projection and move them minus one unit in the X direction. We'll repeat this procedure for the top face, cubic projection, and we will move these UVs out of the way, not in the X, but in the Y direction, minus one unit. The bottom, move it one unit in the opposite direction. The only face not yet projected is the back one. And this one, I'll move it again two units in the Y direction. Okay. Now the only polygons that don't have UVs projected are the rest of the polygons. And by that I mean the ones that in a Rubik's Cube are colored black. In this case, they are the inner polygons and the corners of the little boxes. It is hard to select them one by one, but what I will do instead is select all the faces and then do an invert selection. I could have created a big polygon selection temporarily, but now I've got them all selected. I will do an invert selection and scale these UVs down to zero and move them in a tile where it doesn't overlap with the UVs already created. So I will enter minus one in the X direction and minus one in the Y direction. So there is that. I will now close these panels and create for each of the little cubes an object of its own. And I will do that using the split command in Cinema 4D. First, I will select one face, then select all the polygons connected to it. Remember that these polygons were created by a single cube, so the polygons of a single cube are not in any way connected to the other cubes. That's the way we model them. And now I will use the split. The split command creates a duplicate of the selected polygons as an object, but unfortunately it doesn't delete the original polygons. You will have to do that by hand. I will do the rest by using shortcuts. To select all the connected polygons, I use the U plus W shortcut and to split them, there is another shortcut, U and P. 
and after that I'll delete the original polygons. I will change the mode to lines so that I can easily select what's behind the geometry. The benefit of using this method is that now every object inherits the UV of the original geometry. So all these cubes have their UVs already laid out. The way the split command works is that after all the polygons are split, what remains are just the points of those polygons. So I will delete the original geometry and we are good to go. I will now create a null and parent all the little cubes to this master null. If I now change the mode to object, you will notice that all the cubes have their axis where the original cube had its axis. What we need is to have the axis moved to the center of each cube and we can do that by using the axis center panel. I will change the position of the axis to the center of all points and as soon as I hit the execute button you will notice that all the axes jump to the center of each cube. Let me change the display mode to quick shady lines and now we will create materials for the cube. I will create the first material and call it front, change its default color to red, apply this material to the null and as you see all the cubes inherit the material applied to the master null. Of course this isn't exactly what we want, we want the red to be applied just to the polygons in the front side. Let me align the cube properly. This is the front side. And what we will do is disable tile in the texture tag attributes. And as you see, this material is applied only to the faces in the front side. By default, the projection is using UV mapping information. So in this way, we applied this material to the front faces without having to use polygon selection, but we used the UV information instead. Now let me duplicate this material, call it back, change its default color to orange, apply this material to the null, go to the attributes, disable tile, and now you see that this material is overlapping with the first material, which is not what we want. And if you remember, the UVs for the back side, we put them two units down in the Y direction. In the texture tag, this is the offset V dimension. So we move them down two units, which is 200%. And now you see that the back material is applied to the polygons on the back side of the cube. We will do the rest now. Right. Let's change its color to blue. Disable tiles, offset U. 100, create a new material for the left side, change its color to green, apply it to the null, disable tile, minus 100 in the U direction, top material, change color to white, offset V, minus 100 disable tile and for the button I'll set the color to yellow and offset V 100. You can see through now because there is no material applied to the rest of the geometry. We will create a new material for the rest, give it a black color, apply it to the null, disable tiles, and if you remember 
I moved it minus one in the x direction and minus one unit in the y direction. Now we have created and textured the cube and we are ready to move on to setting it up for animation. In this part of the tutorial, I will talk about constraints. What are they? What's their use? And I will specifically talk about two kinds of constraints. The PSR, or Position Scale Rotation Constraint, and the Parent Constraint. Well, what are constraints? I believe you all are familiar with the parent-child relationship concept not specifically in Cinema 4D, but all 3D. For example, if I take a null, duplicate it, move the second one away, and if I now parent my second null to the first one, and I move the first one, the child null moves with it. It also rotates around the parent object and also scales with it. In many cases in 3D, you will be faced with a need to limit this parent-child relationship. What I mean by that, for example, you will need to be able to follow the rotation of a parent object, but not necessarily its position or scale, or vice versa. You might want to follow the position, but not necessarily rotation or scale. And that is what constraints are. They limit the parent-child relationship. At least, that is the way I like to think about them. Now, I will create a figure and call it target, duplicate it, and call it constraint. I will select the target, add a display tag, and choose lines as shading mode and isoparms as the style. I will move it away and now I will add a constraint tag to the constraint object. Why am I showing you this? Well, the purpose of this introductory lesson is to rebuild the functionality of constraints using Expresso. Why rebuild them in Expresso? Because the constraints that are built using Expresso can be applied to a hierarchy of objects instead of just one single object. I believe the constraint tag in Cinema 4D in itself is just an expression. And what it does is it reads position, scale and rotation information from one object and applies it to another object. But the way the constraint tag does this is per object. And it means that if you have multiple objects that you want to control using one single target, you will have to add a constraint tag to all the constraint objects and then manipulate their data separately for each object. Instead, if we use Expresso, we can use the same Expresso setup to constrain all the objects in a hierarchy, all of them simultaneously. So, the two kind of constraints that I will be talking about are the PSR constraint and the parent constraint. What the PSR does is it requires you to choose a target. I can drag the target in here and you see the object to whom the constraint is applied immediately jumped to the position of the target object. And if I now move the target object, the constraint object follows it. Until now, there is nothing fancy. It is almost the same functionality as in the parent-child relationship. But what the constraint is good for is, for example, we can click the maintain original and what it does is that the constraint object now follows the rotation of the target object. It follows the position of the target object, but with a certain offset. And the offset in this case is 
the difference in the position that the constraint object had at the moment when the constraint became active. To make the constraint object follow the scale of the target object, all I have to do is check this S check here. And now, if I scale the target object, the constraint object follows. How can we build this kind of functionality using Expressing? I will copy these two objects, create a new scene, paste them, and delete the constraint tag from the constraint object. I will add an Expresso tag. Let me change the connection type to direct. It's just a personal preference. And I will drag the target object into the Expresso editor. Output its global matrix from it. Also drag and drop the constraint object and get the global matrix in the input area. If I now connect the global matrix information from the target to the global matrix information in the input of the constraint object, you will see that the constraint object immediately jumps at the position of the target object. And you will see that if I move the target object, the constraint object follows it. That is exactly as in the previous example, like a parent-child relationship. But what if we want to emulate this behavior with maintain original? Well, we can totally do that. First of all, let me explain what the matrix is. The matrix in Cinema 4D and in other 3D applications too is an array of vectors. Every object in Cinema 4D can be dragged to an Expresso and for every object there are coordinates, global coordinates and local coordinates. The global coordinates represent the coordinates in world space for every object and the local coordinates represent the coordinates of the object based on its parent. I'll create a new file, for example, I'll make a cube I will make a pyramid. I will parent the pyramid to the cube and move the cube away from the world center. Let me change the display type to lines. Okay, now the cube coordinates, I'm talking about the position right now, the cube coordinates are minus 320 in the X, zero in the Y and 257 in the Z direction but they are in the world space which means the cube is 220 centimeters away in the x direction from the center of the world and 257 centimeters away in the z direction away from the center of the world but what happens to the pyramid well the pyramid is calculated in the local space of the cube in this case, its parent is the cube. So the pyramid is at the coordinate 0, 0, 0. But in the world space, and let me change here the coordinates to the world, you see that the pyramid has the same coordinates as the cube. So let's turn to our scene. I will close this one. The matrix is just an array, and it contains information about the position, rotation, and scale coordinates of an object. To emulate the behavior of maintain original in the classic constraints, what we will do, we will extract the information from the matrix, and we can do that using an adapter node, matrix to vectors. We will connect the inputs, and now we will choose another adapter node vector to matrix if we connect v1 v2 and v3 which contain information about rotation and scale for the object and we feed this matrix now to the global matrix input of the constraint object what we will see is that now the constraint object respects 
the rotation of the target object, also the scale, but let me first go to object mode. It also respects the scale, but not the position. How can we do it that it follows the position of the target object, but with a certain distance from it? Well, we have to calculate that distance first, and we will do it using some vector math. We will first drag the constraint object in here, get its global matrix, copy and paste this matrix to vectors node, and now we will calculate the distance. We will do that using a math node, open its attributes, change the data type to vector, and the function to subtract. We will subtract this target's global position from the constraints global position and we will store it, this vector information, in a constant node. By default the constant node doesn't have an input, it only presents us with an output, but I will show you a workaround to that. We will first change the data type to vector and now we will drag uh, this icon like a gear into the Expresso and what this does is create an object whose reference is the constant node but this way we are presented with an input which has the same data type a vector like the constant and if we now connect the information from this math node to the input of this constant clone, let me call it. If we now click object from the target from object node into this, this constant, node. you will see that we have now stored the distance of the constraint. We can now delete this port and now we can connect this constant node to the offset of this vector to matrix node. Well, it has jumped in the negative z direction because it now presumes that the start of the vector is the center of the world. We don't want that, we want the start of the vector to be the target position. So, what we will do, we will use another math node, change its data type to vector, connect the offset from the target and this constant which contains the distance between the two objects and this sum of vectors we will feed into this vector to matrix node. Now if we move the target we see that the constraint object follows but with a certain distance. It follows the rotation also even the scale. And that's how we recreate the basic functionality of a PSR constraint using Expresso. Let us now move on and see what the parent constraint type does. The parent constraint acts differently from the PSR constraint in that it resembles more to a parent-child relationship. In the previous example, in the case of the PSR constraint, the object follows the rotation, position and scale of the target, but it rotates and scales around its own local axis. In the parent constraints case, the object completely follows the target's axis. Let me demonstrate that. I will copy these objects to a new scene, disable the PSR constraint, enable the parent constraint, and now let's drag the target in this input field. Now let's see if we rotate the target, the object will rotate with the target but around the target's local space. Let me check the scale. Okay, Now it acts completely as a child of the target object. 
what we can do to rotate the object around its own local axis is check this maintain original and now if we want to rotate the object around its own axis we can do this but in the same time when the target object rotates our object rotates with it so to recapitulate it in the parent constraints case the object completely follows the target's axis it rotates with the target around the target's axis so the angle in relationship to the target doesn't change the same applies for the scale but as we said we can use the maintain original to offset the position rotation or scale values in relationship to the target's axis so this acts like the local position for the constrained object let us now recreate this setup using expresso i will copy these objects to a new scene delete this tag and add an expresso tag to our object reset its position and freeze zero 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 so we will again manipulate matrices here i will not take your time to explain how the matrix node works the cinema 4d manual has many detailed explanation about it but i will show you how to manipulate matrix data to achieve your goals in setups and animation what i will do is drag the target object in the expresso editor get its global matrix data add again a math node but this time we will change its data type to matrix connection type to direct and the function to multiply you might have not seen this before but in the matrix the 0 0 0 rotation is represented by adding 1 in the x value of the v1 vector 1 in the y value of the v2 vector and 1 in the z value of the v3 vector so what we are saying we are multiplying the targets global matrix with an imaginary matrix that has a position of 0 0 0 in the world space and 0 0 0 rotation and we will feed this new matrix to our constrained object what it does it jumps at the position and takes the same rotation as the target now we have the option here at the multiply node to offset its position in the x in the y or in the z let's see what the z coordinate is for the target i'll copy it go back to the multiply and feed it into this numeric input but we of course need the negative value now we have the same relationship as we had in this case where we rotate the target and the constraint object moves along with it let's try it here okay same applies for the scale so if we want to manipulate the object's local coordinates its local position scale and rotation in relationship to the target's position scale and rotation all we have to do is manipulate this matrix for the position it's easy we can just manipulate this vector here but for the rotation and scale it's a little bit trickier and how we create a matrix is like this we first add three constants that will represent the x y and z axis for the rotation 
we add an adapter node and choose a reels to vector node what this will do is combine these constants into a vector and let me tell you cinema 4d doesn't have a native node that converts rotation information into matrix but if you go to the x pool tab and open the system presets under matrix you will find a generate matrix node what it does is it will take rotation information and convert it to a matrix which we can now feed into the input of this math multiply node and you now see that it immediately jumped back at the target's position that is because this newly created matrix has a position of 0, 0, 0 by default because we haven't entered anything yet but we can copy this numeric field create a new reals to vector node paste it in the z coordinate and now feed this vector to the position and feed this matrix into this math multiply node so now if we rotate the target the object will follow accordingly but what we now have the option to do is change the value of the local rotation if you now see i am putting in values one two three and four but the object doesn't rotate one two or three or four degrees that is why cinema 4d internally works with radians not degrees so what we have to do to make the object behave accordingly is convert this real data into radians and expresso has a node just for that in the calculate menu called degree what it does is convert information from radians to degrees but what we want now is degrees to radians let me input it here that's right copy and paste it two more times and now if we change this constant value the object rotates accordingly so this is how we generate a matrix of our own and we multiply it by the targets matrix and feed it to the constraint object okay next we will build a simple example in which we will combine all we have learned so far and then we will go on and apply the notions learned to the cube in the examples that i've already shown you you have seen that the matrix stores the position information as the offset vector and rotation and scale information in the v1 v2 and v3 vectors but there is no separation of rotation and scale they are bundled together i'm showing you these methods because i think they are a valuable resource to the prime and cinema 4d light users who don't have access to no graph module but also they don't have access to the characters tag in the case of cinema 4d light i will go ahead and show you some other examples where we can make use of the matrix information and the first example will be to show you how an object can follow only the rotation of a target object but not its scale to do this i will add a figure let me scale it down to say 300 i will also add an all change its display mode to sphere and move it away from the world's center and what i want to accomplish is have the figure follow just the node's rotation not its position nor its scale let me add an espresso tag to the figure i will drag 
the null object into the Expresso Manager. Let me open some space here and get its global matrix data. I will go and use an adapter node, matrix to vectors, to separate its transformation info. I will change connection type to direct. Use another adapter node, vectors to matrix. Connect V1, V2, and V3 together. And now I will feed this matrix in the global matrix input of the figure. We have already done this type of exercise, but we will continue from this point. Now what happens is that whenever we rotate the null, the figure follows. It doesn't follow its position. Its position is stuck to the world's center at the coordinates 0, 0, 0. That is because the matrix that we are feeding to the figure, if we click this node, we see that the offset vector has a value of 0, 0, 0. What we want is for this object to have its own position. So we will drag the figure in the Expresso Manager, get its global matrix out, use again a matrix to vectors node. Let me copy this one. I will make some space here and get its offset vector fed to this vector to matrix node. What happens now is that whenever I move the figure around, it moves freely, but it still follows the null's rotation. All fine and good, but there is one problem. If we change the mode to object and scale this null, you will see that the figure scales along with it. That is okay if that's what you're aiming for, but what if you don't want the figure to follow the null's scale? Well, we will have to separate the rotation from the scale information in the matrix, and it is not hard to do, just a little bit trickier. There is a method to separate the rotation and scale info from the matrix node. We should be able to control rotation and scale separately. In fact, the rotation info in a matrix is stored in a minus one to one range. How is it possible? A simple look at basic trigonometry will remind you that any angle can be represented in a sine, cosine, or tangent function in a range from minus 1 to 1. Don't worry, you don't have to know how the formula is calculated to make use of it. Just remember that V1 stores the orientation and scale of the x-axis, V2 the orientation and scale of the y-axis, and V3 stores the orientation and scale of the z-axis. By default, the scale of any object you create in Cinema 4D is of a scale of 1. So the range of angles shouldn't get any wider than minus 1 to 1. Let me demonstrate it. I will drag the figure down, get its global matrix, and I will get a result node. I will change its, its data type to matrix and feed the figure matrix here. Now, whenever I rotate the null, you will see the matrix, the V1, V2, and V3 range doesn't go beyond minus one to one range. Whatever angle I use here, the range remains between these limits. But, as soon as I scale this null object, you will see that the values go up and the factor by which these values are multiplied is the same as this factor. In this case, I have multiplied the x by a factor of 1.551. The v2 vector is multiplied by a factor of minus 11 point three three eight and the v3 value is multiplied by a factor of one point 
551. Let me reset these values to its default. To summarize it, if we scale an object, the range of vectors v1, v2, and v3 is multiplied by the same factor that we used for the scale. There is a method to limit this range from minus 1 to 1 using an adapter node called universal and its data type must be changed to normal. A normalized vector is a vector whose length is only one unit long. So a normalized orientation vector can have a range of values going from minus 1 to 1. So a normalized vector is nothing more than a vector. The only difference is that its length is 1. Let me connect this v1 to the universal node and reconnect it to the v1 input. Let me copy it two more times and let's connect the nodes like this. Well, at a first glance nothing seems to have changed, but if we now scale the null, you can see that the figure doesn't follow its scale. You can see the null is scaled by a factor of 6.876, but the figure is still at a default scale of 1. So we have managed to separate the rotation from the scale info. What if we want to do the inverse? The figure scale to follow the null's scale, but not necessarily its rotation. I will show you how to do that in the next example. We will continue where we left off in the previous example. And here is where we left off. We have created this setup where the figure follows the rotation of the null object, but not its scale. What if we want to achieve the inverse of this? So we want the figure to follow the null's scale, but not necessarily its rotation. Well, there is a way to achieve that and I will show it to you right now. We will use part of the setup that we have already created. Let me make more space here. First, we will add an adapter node, a vector to real, and extract the x-axis from the v1 vector. We'll do the same for the v2 vector, but this time we will extract the y-channel information and last we'll do it for the v3 vector but in this case we will extract the z-channel information and what we will use this information for is to divide I will choose a float math node a float math node is very similar to a math node but what it allows you to do is do, in this case, vector mathematics, but the first input data is a vector and the second input data is a float value. A float value is another way of saying a real number. So we will do a division. This time we will divide the v1 vector by this x value. I will copy and paste this float math node two times for the other channels. The input will be v2 and v3 and the float value will be the y channel of this normalized vector and the z channel from the normalized value of v3. We're not done yet. What we have done so far, in simple words, is in this case, let's take an arbitrary number, a full number for better visualization. What we have done so far is divided this 2 by 1, divided this 2 by 1, and this 2 by 1. What it gives us is, as you 
have easily guessed, 2. And uh, this is the factor by which the vector will be multiplied. So, to multiply this vector, I will use a math node, change its data type to vector, its function to multiply, add this division's result to the first input, and in the second input, in this case we are working just with the x value, I will multiply the x by 1 and leave the y and z to 0. Let me copy and paste this multiplication node twice, and for the v2 we will change the y value to 1, and for v3 we will change the z value to 1. So what we have done is taken the scale factor and multiplied just the channel we are interested in. In this case we have multiplied the v1 by this factor, the v2 by the same factor, and v3 by the same factor. Let us now connect these vectors back to the vector to matrix node, and as you see, the figure is scaled by a factor of 2, and it follows the scale of this null. Not only that, but if we check for the rotation, it doesn't follow its rotation, just the scale. I hope it makes sense to you. Let me recapitulate it for you. We took these normalized vectors, took the different channels apart. And why we did this? Because now we can, for example, change the scale just for the z separately, the y separately, and the x separately. So we took these normalized vectors, made a division to find out the factor of the scale, and then we multiplied this factor for each channel by 1 and the rest of the channels by 0. In the case of the x, we just multiplied x by 1. For the y, we multiplied y by 1 and left x and z to 0. And in the case of z, we multiplied x and y by 0 and z by 1. We fed this information to a vector to matrix node and remember the figure has the position information from itself. So the figure can move freely around but follow the scale of the null. Next we will do another example to reuse all this information into a different kind of setup. And now, to better illustrate the concepts we have learned so far, I will do yet another example, but this time with a different scenario. What I want is to have this figure. Let me scale it down to 100. Okay. I want this figure to follow this null's rotation and this second null's scale, but I want it to move freely in the scene. So what I'll do is rename this null rotation, this other null scale, and I will add a new expresso tag to the figure. First, I will deal with the scale. Let me get this matrix information out. I'll add a matrix to vectors adapter. As we did earlier, I will use a universal node with a data type changed to normal. Duplicate it three times. Get another adapter node, vector to reals. So I can get one channel out of each universal normalized vector, add a float math node, change its data type to vector and the function to divide, 
copy it three times, one for each vector of the matrix. And now I will divide V1 by the X channel of the normalized value of V1. I will divide V2 by the Y channel of the normalized V2 value. And I will divide V3 by the Z channel of the normalized V3 vector. I will zero out the channels that I do not want to be affected. I will use another math node, change its data type to vector, the function to multiply, duplicate it two times, and now multiply these results. For V1, I want just the X. For V2, I want just the Y. And for V3, I want just the Z channel active. And zero out the rest. I will now add a vector to matrix node. And combine these vectors into this node. Now I have the scale data for the scale node which I can add to the figure global matrix. And now let's change the node to object. If I scale up or down the scale null, the figure follows its scale, but not its position, nor its rotation. And how do we get the rotation info of the rotation null to drive the rotation of the figure? We'll first add the rotation null into Expresso, get its global matrix out. I will copy this part of the setup and let us combine these data back into a vector to matrix node. This is just the rotation info. And for the position, we want the figure to be free of the influence of any other object. We want its position to be driven by itself. We'll get the matrix data and feed its offset to this new matrix. And now we will combine these two matrices into one by using a simple math node. Change its data type to matrix, function to multiply, and the order in which we connect these matrices into the math multiply node is very important. The rotation and position matrix should be first and the scale info should go in the second input. Let's now connect this result to the global matrix of the figure and let us test the result. First, I want to move the object around and it moves freely around. Second, I want to have the figure follow the rotation of this null. And if we test the scale, it doesn't do anything because the scale is defined by the scale of this null, the scaled null. You can go ahead and experiment yourself with these concepts and when you are ready, follow the next parts of the tutorial. A very important concept to understand when you are building a rig such as this is the concept of incrementally updating transformations. What I mean by that? Let me show you. I will first create our friend the figure. Lower its height to say 100. And add an Expresso tag to it. Get its matrix information out. I will expand this matrix information into vectors and combine them together again into 
a vector to matrix node. We will first work on the offset and what we will do now is get our figure here in again and feed this matrix to the global matrix again. Let me open the space here. Now what we have created is some kind of a loop and the figure is getting information from the figure itself. But what we can do now is mess around with these vectors and see what the result will be. Now I will take a math node, change its data type to vector, feed the offset output here and this result I'll feed back to this vector to matrix node in the offset channel. Now nothing happens, it's perfectly the same as it was before but what I can do now is change the value in this input to field say in the z direction I will add 10 and look what happens the figure jumps 10 units in the z direction whenever I refresh the view by hitting A on the keyboard the figure keeps jumping 10 units in the Z axis. And if I change this value to negative 10, the figure jumps 10 units forwards. Whenever I reset the value to zero and I refresh the view, nothing happens. The figure just respects the input we give it from the 3D viewport. So this is a very important concept because we will be animating our cube without any keyframes and we will use this method to animate it. Granted, a cube doesn't move, a cube only rotates, so what we will try to do is apply this concept to the rotation transformation. Let me open more space here. And instead of feeding the offset, I will feed the V3 vector. V3 contains information about a rotation along the Z axis. And I will feed this result back into the V3 input of the vectors to matrix node. I will refresh the viewport by hitting A on the keyboard, but I can also do it by jumping one frame forward or backward and that refreshes the viewport thus updating the transformation. There's nothing to update yet because the values are 0, 0, 0 in the math add node but if I now update this value and say 1 look what happens instead of rotating the figure gets scaled in the z direction that is because let me undo the transformation not by hitting undo but by reversing the value we fed so far update the viewport several times to take the figure back at its original shape reset it to zero to be able to interact with the rotation transformation we will not use this math add node but we'll take a different course first let me delete this input port so that we don't accidentally change the shape or transformation of the figure and I will delete this math node there is a node in Expresso in the calculate group called matrix to HPB and this gets a matrix as an input but instead of outputting v1 v2 and v3 information which is combined information for orientation and scale it outputs information just for the rotation not scale so what we can now do is combine these channels using a reals to vector node i will combine them into a single vector and now I will add a math 
change its data type to vector again, function to add, we'll leave it to the default. And now in the system presets, I will go to the matrix group and choose this generate matrix node. It is a custom made node. Cinema 4D doesn't have a built-in node for this. This is CoffeeScript node, but Maxon is generous enough to include it as a preset. And what we will do is add this vector to the rotation input, and this will generate a new matrix. We can get rid of this node now because the generate matrix node has a position vector also, which we can get from the offset of this one. And now what I will do is feed this new matrix back into the figure global matrix input. It looks like nothing happened, but now if I go back to this math node and raise this Z channel to 1, you see that the figure automatically updated to a new orientation. If I now update it again, you will see that the figure rotates. But the increment amount by which it rotates is wrong because I put a value of 1 here, but as you see, the figure rotates almost, almost 90 degrees. Why is that? Well, that is because Cinema 4D internally thinks of angles not in degrees but in radians. That can easily be fixed. What I will do is disconnect this port. I will reset the coordinates of the figure. I will now take a degree node which does this conversion of radians to degrees and degrees to radians. What I need now is conversion from degrees to radians. I will need a new constant node, change its type to vectors, separate the vectors into reals data, And now feed each of the channels x, y, z into a new degree node. Combine this information again into a vector. Let me be sure that we're doing the right conversion. We need to convert degrees to radians. And now I will feed this new vector into the math input node. Let me get this matrix now back into the global matrix of the figure. And now we should be able to control the increment amount of the rotation. Let's say 30 degrees in the Z direction. Let me update and it now behaves correctly. How do I know this? Because if I update it three times, the figure should be rotated 90 degrees from its previous state. Let me now change this value to 90. and You will see that whenever I update the viewport or I move forwards or backwards in time, the figure keeps rotating by 90 degrees. If we want to change the direction, we can zero out Z input and let's update the X input. You see now that the figure updates not around the X but around the Y axis. That is because internally Cinema 4D has this system called heading beach and bank for rotation and that is how Cinema 4D itself calculates orientation. 
well that's no big problem for us because if we want to rotate around the x we just zero out this value and update the middle one instead if we want it to go backwards enter minus 10 to get it back to its default position the reason why it kept jumping when it reached 90 degrees is a phenomenon called gimbal lock in 3D and if you want to know what gimbal lock is go ahead and watch some tutorials online there are a lot of them that explain this phenomenon what we will do in the Rubik's Cube setup is find a way to get around this problem and I will show you how so let me get the figure back at its previous state and you see that whenever I put zero in the input the figure doesn't get updated we can use that in our advantage because as you have guessed we can update the rotation of the cubes with this method and whenever the cubes are rotated in the right amount we can stop the rotation by resetting this value Now it is time to start building the Rubik's Cube setup. And I will start by first adding an Expresso tag to the master object and add some controls to this tag. I like to create the controls on the tag itself instead of the object where the tag is attached to because this way I can easily attach this tag to another object and the controls will be linked to it so let me first add some custom user data i will create a group add the first user data and the first thing i want to create is a button that will turn the custom build rig on or off and I will call it just that on slash off and the data type will be a boolean because it only has two states on or off the default value will be off second I will add another data of type float and call it transition length and what this will allow us to do is determine the rotation length for each of the faces I will keep its data type to float we don't need it to be animatable its unit will be real I don't need limit so I can enter anything for the duration of the transition but I will give a default value of 5 now I will add controls for each of the rotation possibilities that we have. Let me first close this window, minimize the Expresso editor, and let me show you what I mean. The cube has six faces, and that gives us a total of 24 possible rotations, counting the 180 degrees as a rotation possibility. But we can also do 180 degrees by adding 90 twice. So what we will create here is custom user data that represents all the possible rotations for the cube's faces. I've already created this data. Let me remove it. I'll add a new one and I'll change the data type from its default value to integer, the interface, will be quick tab radio and the way we create the buttons is like this we'll start from zero and type the names of the faces so the first possibility will be top plus meaning top 90 degrees rotation in the clockwise direction the next possibility is top minus for 90 degrees in the counterclockwise direction 
and so on for the next phases. I will pause the video here and come back when I have written all the possible moves. Okay, I have now written down all the possible moves and I can preview them if I switch to this example. This is how they will look like. In older versions of Cinema 4D, this type of preview is not possible because they don't have the Quick Tab Radio option available. But you have one of the other ones, like radio, cycle button or cycle, and you can work with them too. I just think it's easier for me to interact with the cube by using this mode. I will change the name to rotations or even better, select face and to be able to rotate each phase by 180 degrees, what I will do is add another data called repeat. It will be of a data type boolean and we are good to go. And I see that I've forgotten something. Let me go back to the custom user data manager. I want to have a reset state for each cube and for that I will create a custom data called reset. This will be of type boolean. Let me add it to this group also. And now we are good to go. The first thing we will do is store a reset transformation state for each cube so that whatever transformations we do we can restore them to their initial state and the way we are going to do it is using Expresso also. As you have seen Cinema 4D offers us tools that enable us to create custom properties for each object or tag. What we want to store now in each object is a matrix information in the default state. Instead of having to go to each object, add a user data of type matrix, that would be tedious to do. There are in total 27 cubes that make up this Rubik's cube. I will do a little workaround. A quick workaround is to use one tag in the master object. In this case, I will use Fong and I will explain why. Add a custom user data to it. Let me add a group, call it reset state and add a custom data to it. Let's call it reset of type matrix. Why matrix? Because it has all transformation information available. It can store position, rotate and scale in the same place. Okay, now what I will do is go to the tags menu in the object manager and choose copy tag to children. Watch what happens. Nothing much it seems, but if you click on all these tags attached to each child cube, you will see that now they have an edit tab to them which will store the matrix information. And the reason why I chose a Fong tag is that a Fong tag is something that is present only once for an object. Instead, an object can have multiple texture tags, you see, but only one Fong tag. So. By adding a custom phone tag to the master object, I could easily copy all user data attached to the tag to all objects without having to go on a per object base and add custom user data, which would be a very tedious process. 
Now I will use Expresso to fill this matrix information with the correct data for each cube. I will do that by using a hierarchy node. The start path will be down and the iteration path will be next. So we are sure we will get all the cubes. I will add a tag node. This tag will get its information from the objects in the hierarchy. The tag type will be Fong. And what I have to do is drag and drop only one of the tags in the hierarchy. And what we want to write is this reset input, which is of type matrix. Where will we get this info from? Well, we will get it from this hierarchy of objects. Coordinates, global matrix, and we will feed this matrix information into the reset input. Watch what happens now if you click on each of the Fong tags, you will see that the matrix information is different for each one, representing the current state of each little cube. I will now delete this port so that I cannot accidentally mess up this information and I will move this hierarchy away so that we don't override anything. We can even group these nodes together using a convert to X group node. And what it will do is give us a way to move these nodes out of our active view altogether, not one by one. I will call this group reset state and move on with the next task. Now, in order to automate the process of animation, I want to create a custom counter. And what this custom counter will do is, let's say, for the default transition length of five frames, will keep active the dynamic transformation of the cubes. And once this length is exceeded, it will stop counting and will wait for our input of the next face selection. So whenever I choose, for example, bottom plus, the bottom face of the cube will be rotated 90 degrees in the clockwise direction in the time interval of five frames. And once these five frames are passed, the counter will stop counting and it will start counting again whenever I choose another face to animate and so on and so on. Well, we will start to build this counter and that will be our next task. The base for the custom timer tool will be the time node. It has some very interesting info that I previously didn't think useful in any way. I will not go into the details of each one of these. You can, of course, consult the Cinema 4D manual. But I will talk about one info in particular, and that is the previous info. What the previous info does, it gives us information about the previous state in time. And by that, I don't mean the previous frame, but the previous state, because Believe it or not, time has a positive flow and a negative flow. And what I mean by negative flow is that time in Cinema 4D can go in reverse. Not in all cases, but in specific ones, you can find that useful. And this is one of those cases. What do I mean by previous state in time? Well, if I get a print to console node, I can demonstrate it to you. I can print out the time info in the console and as I move forwards in time you see that the output in the console will get updated but not by a full number each frame. 
and that is because time information gets calculated in seconds. We also have frame information, which gives us the current frame. And as you can see, the current line in the console matches the current frame here in the 3D view. But what does the previous information do? Well, it gets us the previous state in time. For example, if I am now at frame 49, the previous state in time is 48. Now I move to 50, so the previous state in time is 49. If I instead go backwards, now my current frame is 49, but my previous state in time is 50 because I moved one frame backwards. You know what I mean. The problem is that the previous info by default calculates in seconds. That's not a big problem, but what if we want to get the previous state in time measured in frames? Well, the time node gets us this frame per second information, which we can use in a math node to multiply the current time by the current frame per seconds. And now if I output this to the console, you can see that it outputs our current frame. That is not necessary if we use the regular time info because we already have here a frame info. But if we want to get our previous info measured in frames, what we can do is multiply this previous output with the current frames per second and it will get us the previous state in time. Let me update time by going one frame forwards and you see that now our current frame is 69 and our previous state of time is 68 because we moved one frame in the positive direction in time. And that happens automatically for every frame I move forwards. Why is this useful to us? It will become clear in a moment. Remember the incremental update of transformations that we played with some lessons ago? Well, we updated the position and rotation of an object, taking into account its current values. So for each refresh of the Cinema 4D viewport, the transformation gets updated with an increment based on its previous state. That concept can be applied in other areas as well, not just transformation. In this case, we will incrementally increase or incrementally update rather the value of a constant node using time increments. And this is what I mean. I will get a constant node, leave the data type to real, and I will create an object node by dragging this gear icon of the constant node. And what this creates is an object with reference to this constant node. This is useful because we can now add a value to this constant. And this value, we can feed it, for example, by the frame number. And if we print out this info, we have exactly what we had before. But now the frame information gets filtered by this constant node. We will complicate things a little bit because now I will add another math node and I will add the frame number to the constant. First of all, you see now that the constant value is not zero, but it is what it gets from the frame information, you see. But what if we now add this value of the constant to the current frame number? This is what happens. You can see now that it updates, it adds the current frame number to the constant value. And that gets quickly out of hand because we now don't want to add the current frame, but we want to add the current step of the time. And the current step of the time is one frame. So if we update the scene by one frame, we want to constantly add one to this constant value. And how do we get that? We get that by 
comparing our current frame with our previous frame and that would always give us a constant of one how do we do that we take a equal node and we compare if our current frame is equal or not with our previous frame sure it is not equal if the time changes but this equal node will output a boolean and a boolean is simply a true or false statement so if the current frame is equal to the previous frame and by that i don't mean exactly previous frame but the previous state of time then this value will get a true output but if the current frame is not equal to the previous state in time then this node will output a value of false so let me print this out now if i move forwards in time you see that the value only outputs false even if i go backwards in time the value outputs false but if i deliberately refresh the viewport I did this wrong. I need the inverse and say not equal. Now it always says true. This true in computer language can be a value of one and the false statement can be translated to a value of zero. So if I now feed this not equal node result to this method, what I will get is I continuously add one to the current constant value. I don't know if it makes sense. Let me reset this constant value and start from zero. Go to the first frame first and reconnect the value. If we move forwards, the value of, of the constant continuously increases by one unit. That is valuable because now, let me make more space here, because now we can take a compare node and compare if this value is less or equal than some other value. And let's compare it with the transition length from this expressor node. I will drag this expressor node into the expressor editor, get the transition length output and compare this value to our constant value that continuously increases as we said let's now print out the output of the compare node i'll go back and i will reset this constant's value back to zero let me reconnect it and for the first frame this setup gives us true we will go forwards five frames in time that is the value of our transition one two three four five and at the moment that we surpass the value of five this compare node gives us a false value that is the counter is reset to zero to make it more clear i will add a universal node and that will translate this false or true value into zeros and one so let me go back to frame zero let me disconnect this input to the constant so that i can reset its value and i'll reconnect it so as long as we are within the boundaries of zero to five frames the value of the counter will be one but as soon as we are beyond the five frames limit the value will be zero so let's start one two three four five and now if we go to frame six the value will be zero so what we have now created is a simple version of a custom timer we have still work to do but this is the basic idea now what if we don't want the timer to start at frame zero what if we want to start it on a later frame 
in time. We can do that too. And the second problem is that if we want to reset the time in this current state, we have to disable this constant input, reset the value of the constant by hand, and then go back to the first frame and initialize the counter again. That is not very convenient for us, but we can automate the process a bit. We will again input this expressor node into the manager and get this on off custom data that we created earlier. And what I will do is add a math node, set its function to multiply, and I will multiply this add node result with the on off switch in our custom commands and input this one instead here in the constant value. Okay, I will add a color to quickly find the nodes related to the constant. So I will color code them. In this case, I'll choose blue. And now what we have is the ability to turn the counter on or off whenever we need to. So now it is on and let us test it. I will go forwards in time. One, two, three, four, five, six. It gets back to zero. And it continues to stay off. Now I can turn the setup on or off by using this switch. One, two, three, four, five. And when it gets to six, it zeroes itself out. Okay. Well, you can see now that We have a problem here, and the problem is that whenever the node is off, the setup still outputs one. And that is because whenever the time is updated, it still adds one to the current value of the constant. We can do something for that too. We can duplicate this math node and multiply this compares output again with the on off switch value and now we will output this value to the print console let me better organize these nodes so it doesn't get messy I will color code expressor nodes with a different color. Node. Okay. I will choose red in this case. So I know that everything colored red is something that has to do with the expressor node where we have all the custom controls. And now let me test the setup again. I'll go to the first frame and you, you can see that the counter doesn't work or outputs a value of zero as long as we don't have it turned on. And now I will turn it on. It outputs one immediately. And whenever I go forwards in time, two, three, four, five, now when I exceed the value of five, it will turn itself off again. Okay, if I want to turn it on again, all I have to do is disable and re-enable it and update the time. I will go now backwards. One, two, three, four, five, six. It turns itself off. Let me do it again. Off, on. I'll move again back in time. One, two, three, four, five, and at six, it turns itself off. Now we have created a more sophisticated timer. 
we can set the transition length to a custom value. Let's test the timer with a transition length of, say, 10. I'll turn it on. Let me clear the console and move 10 frames forward in time. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And at 11, it will turn itself off. Let's test it for time that goes in the negative direction. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And at 11, it goes back off. Well, what I need now is a functionality that will enable me to turn the timer on whenever I change faces. That way the timer goes on whenever I change the face and goes off whenever the transition length time has passed. There are two ways of doing this and I will show you both of them. Let us have a look at the select face control we just created. I will take this print to console node and see what this select face gets us. Let me clear the console and whenever I change this value you see that it prints out the value that each of these buttons is stored to and the range goes from 0 to 11. Well, not 10, 11. Let's see what's wrong. Open the user data manager, select face. Oh, I have entered 10 twice for back plus and back minus. Let me edit it. And now these values should be in the range between 0 and 11. That doesn't help us much because what we want is a reset state for our custom counter. That is, the counter will start counting whenever I change the face selection here. So, how is it done? Let me show you. The first method is using the memory node present in Expresso. And let me tell you how the memory node works. It stores different states of a value of different data types. You see, here is a long list of data types that the memory node can work with. But for our purpose, we only need integer data type. So what the memory node does is store different states of this input value. And the input value in our case will be this select face integer, which is from 0 to 11. Let me print out the output from the memory node. And currently, in its default state, the data will just flow through the memory node unchanged. So, what does this mean? This means that the data that will be printed out in the console is the same as the data that goes into the memory node. But, as I said, the memory node can save different states of this value. What I mean by different states? Well, if I now am at the back minus and change my selection to top plus, the memory node can save the back minus information in memory and it can print it out for me, although I'm currently in the top plus phase. And how can we store that value in memory? We can change the history depth. So instead of one, which only stores the current state of the value, I will increase it to two. And what that does, it stores for me the value in the state it was before I updated the viewport or before I updated the time. But the time, as you know, can be positive or negative. So let's say that the history depth stores the information that the value had before I updated the viewport. So what happens now? Let me test. I am now at the top plus phase. And if I now change to front minus, the value printed out instead of zero should be nine. But now as I click, you see that it prints 9 because I'm currently looking at the current level. If I now increase this 
to 1 and let me go back to demonstrate it. If I now change it back to 0, you see that the console instead printed 9 because it's not printing the current state, it's printing the previous state. You understand what I mean? So whenever I change it to say left for example, it will still print out the value of top plus which is 0. And whenever I click back to top, it will print out 6. Okay, how is this useful to us? Well, we can use a comparison node, in this case an equal node, to compare our current state with our previous state. And let's print out the result. The result is a boolean data type, true or false, and maybe it's confusing to you, so let me use a universal node to convert this data type in a real number from 0 to 1. So, what we can now do is test what the console will be printing. So now the previous state is not equal to the current state of the value. But if I update the viewport, it prints out 1, which means that the current state is equal to the previous state. And it stays 1 because we didn't change the value. As soon as I change the value, the result will be zero because the current state is different from what it used to be. And whenever I refresh the viewport or I change the time, it goes back to one because now they are both the same, the current and the previous state. How does this benefit us? Well, let me make more space here. What I can do is take the result of this equal node and add it as an input to this multiplication node. Why is that? Because instead of having to go and turn on or off the counter to reset the value back to zero for the constant, the constant resets itself to zero whenever we change the face we are currently on. Let me demonstrate it to you as soon as I make some more space here. We don't need this universal converter. So, what happens? At the first frame and going on forwards, the frame increment will be 1, which will be added to the constant value of 0. Now, this constant has a value of 1, and as I move forward in time, I will add 1 again to this, and it gets stored in the constant again. So, for each frame, the constant increases by a value of 1. And we compare this value to the length of the transition. And whenever the length of a transition is smaller or equal to the value of the constant, we will, in the future steps, we will update a certain value in a matrix. And whenever the constant value is greater than the transition length, it will stop updating the value in the matrix. And how do we reset the counter? We reset the counter first by turning on or off the counter itself or whenever we change a face selection. Let us see again in the console. Whenever I turn on the counter, let me connect the printed console node, it will output 1. And while the count is shorter or equal to the transition length let me decrease it to five okay and count one two three four five it will output one so a certain value will be manipulated or updated in a matrix and whenever it exceeds the length transition in this case five it will output zero so the counter is turned automatically off how do i turn it back on well it starts to count whenever I change the face and the rotation type in the select face command. Let me update the counter. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And as soon as it hits six, it turns itself off again. This works whenever the time moves in a positive direction, but it also works when the time goes in the negative direction. And that will be very handy later on because we can play with a cube as the time goes forward or backwards.
Now comes the time to actually put the counter to good use. To actually manipulate data, we can really see updated in the viewport. And that is what we're going to do in the next lesson. What we will now do with the information coming out from this null is multiplied by the number of degrees that the cubes will rotate themselves around the parent node. Let me make it more clear. I will first get a constant node, set its value to 90 because the cubes will rotate 90 degrees for each move around the parent node. I will feed this 90 degrees to a reals to vector node, thus creating a rotating vector. For the moment, I'll only feed it to the Z channel, create a multiplication node of type vector, and feed this result coming out of the counter to the multiplications input. And now this is the rotating vector, so to speak. I will generate a matrix, a rotating matrix with this vector. And what this rotating matrix will drive is the local matrix for each of the cubes around the parent null. How do I get the local axis for all the cubes? We'll use an iterator type node called hierarchy. What the hierarchy will do is get the object's information for all the children of the object where the expresso node in this case is attached. So it will get information for all these cubes. I will drag one of the cubes into the expresso manager, doesn't matter which one, and feed this hierarchy object data into this node's object data. What I will do now is output the local matrix from this cube, but instead of the local matrix of one of the cubes, it will output the local matrices for all the cubes. And you can see it here printed in the console window. As you remember from the earlier examples, we used a math node to drive an object's transformation by the transformations of another object. In this case, we'll multiply the local matrices for all the cubes by this new matrix that we generated and the order in which we connect these matrices in the math multiply node is very important. In the upper socket will go the matrix that will be the driver and in the lower socket will be the matrix that will be driven. So this information I will feed back into the local matrix of all the cubes connect the object information back to the hierarchy and feed this matrix to the local matrix for all the cubes. It doesn't look like much happened, but if I now update the view, it doesn't update because we have to change to one of the moves here. And you see that the cube rotates around the Z axis of the master null. But as you see, there's something wrong with this setup. The cube doesn't rotate 90 degrees, but it takes a different value. Actually, that happens because as we have set up the expresso right now, the cubes are not rotating by 90 degrees, but as I mentioned earlier, Cinema 4D internally doesn't work with degrees, but with radians. And now we have created a constant rotating vector of 90 radians instead of 90 degrees and we can use a converter node, a degree node, that will convert this value of 90 from degrees to radians. And I'll reconnect it. And here is what happens. The cube doesn't seem to be rotating, but it is jumping by 90 degrees each time I refresh the viewport. That is not what we want. What we want is this. For the transition length, in time, we want the cube to rotate from 0 to 90 degrees, okay? So the increment will not actually be 90, but it will be a value of 90 divided by the number of frames that the transition lasts. So I will use a math node 
change its function to divide. I will again drag the Expresso node into the setup, get out its transition length data. And what I will do is divide this value of 90 by the transition length and feed this information back into the radiance to degree node. And now what happens is that each time the view is refreshed, the cube will be rotated by 90 degrees in the time interval of five frames. In fact, let me change the length of the scene from the default to say 500 frames. Better watch what's happening. Now, each time I change to a new button, a new move, the cube rotates by 90 degrees along the master's Z axis. Let me stop the scene, go back. There is another way to write down this amount of degrees. If you remember from trigonometry class, a full circle can be expressed using a simple expression called 2 times pi. And I can get that constant by changing its data to string. And here I will write 2 times pi. This is a full circle, but we don't want the cubes to be rotated by 360 degrees. We want it to be rotated by 90 degrees. So I'll divide this 2 times pi by 4, and this will get me the 90 degrees, but expressed in radians instead. I will use a math node to divide this value, this 90 degrees, by the transition length, and I will feed this back to the Z channel of this newly generated vector. And the result should be the same. Yes, indeed, the result is the same. What if we want to reset the cubes, set them back to their initial position? That is why we created these custom datas called reset, and now it's time to make use of them. By using the same hierarchy node, we will now get information not about the objects that are children of this null, but we'll get information that is stored in these tags that are attached to each object that is a child of the null. I'll do that using another node that we can find in the iterator group of nodes called tag, and the tag type will be fong. Information of the object will be read from this hierarchy node. Let me drag one of the tags that we want to drive information from, get tag information from the tag node, and what we want to output is the reset matrix, which is the default position, rotation and scale information for each cube. If I now connect this matrix to the local matrix for each cube, the cube should jump back to its initial state. Okay? Now, if we want to rotate the cubes again, we connect back this value, and if we now refresh or play the time forwards, the cube should rotate accordingly. To turn it back to the initial state, we connect this value instead. Okay, let's now automate this process. I can do it by adding a logic node, or rather a node that is found in the logic group of Expresso node called condition. And condition works on many data types, and the type we want is matrix. What we want to drive the switch of the condition node is the reset button in our Expresso tag. So, when the value of the reset button is zero, when the checkbox is disabled, we will get the information from the rotating matrix, and whenever the reset button is checked, we will get this matrix from our reset state. And now, 
we will feed this data to the local matrix. Let me color code the nodes that are related to our Expresso tag. I'll color them red so I can easily find them later if I need them. And let us check what we have done. I'll play the animation forwards, change my face selection, and whenever I press the reset button, the cube is sent back to its initial state. Cool, right? For the moment, we only rotate the cube around the z-axis of the parent node. But of course, we don't want that. We want to rotate a face that we select around a different axis according to the face that we select. For example, for the top, we want to rotate the cubes around the y-axis, that is also for the bottom. For the right and left, we want the cubes to be rotated around the x-axis. And for the front and back, we want them to be rotated around the z-axis. We can set up a condition node for that, and that is what we'll do in the next lesson. Let us now find a way that will enable us to rotate the cubes around a certain axis based on the selection of the Select Faces buttons. We will again make use of a condition node. And what we'll be modifying is this vector. Until now, we have been rotating everything around the Z axis for the master now. But we want to be able to rotate around other axes as well. Now let me duplicate this real to vectors node two more times and I will connect the value that comes from this constant divided by the transition length first to this y channel and then to this x channel. Now we have three vectors and we will create a condition node, change its type to vector. Let's see. We have in total 12 moves and that is exactly how many inputs this condition node will have. By default it comes with two inputs. We'll add the rest. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Let me optimize make more room. So, the output of this condition node will replace this connection. What will drive the switch of the condition node is again the Expresso node and the output will be select face. For the top and bottom faces we want them to be rotated around the heading axis which corresponds to the y-axis of the null object and let me connect it let's test it i'll hit play and we see that the cubes rotate accordingly around the heading i'll reset the cube and i'll do the rest now the y channel will, will get fed to the next four inputs of the condition node and last, the vector which has only the Z channel active. Let me test it again. Top. Sorry, let's deactivate the reset button. Top rotates around the heading. Right and left rotate around the pitch or around the X axis of the null object and front and back rotate around the z-axis. Now there's still a problem. When I hit the top plus button, the cubes should rotate in the clockwise direction. And when I hit the top minus, the cube should rotate in the counterclockwise direction. So currently all these buttons make the cube rotate in the counterclockwise direction. So for the top plus and bottom plus, 
we will need to invert these vectors. And the same is true for the right plus, left plus, front plus, and back plus. We can do that easily in Expresso using a negate node, change its data type to vector and get the vector information. So we'll feed it at the input corresponding to the top plus, bottom plus. Let me check what I've done. Top plus rotates clockwise, top minus counterclockwise, bottom plus clockwise, bottom minus counterclockwise. So everything is working for the top and bottom. Let us repeat the procedure for the right, left, front and back faces. I will duplicate this negate node twice. Let me rearrange them and feed the result of this negate node to where the right plus and left plus input correspond and the last one for the front plus and back plus inputs. Let's check right plus, left plus, front plus and it seems that I've misplaced these ones. Okay, should be the other way around so let me connect them in the right order. That's it. Okay. All fine and good, except now it is evident that there's a problem. And the problem is that currently we can only rotate the faces by 90 degrees. If you have ever watched a tutorial on how to solve a Rubik's Cube puzzle, you may have noticed that there are not 12 but 24 possible moves and that includes the 180 degree move. Currently there is no way to rotate the faces by 180 degrees but it is understandable that we can rotate each face twice by 90 degrees to achieve the 180 degree movement. But in the way that this setup is built, if you double click on each button, you will notice that it doesn't rotate twice. That is because this Expresso setup, as it is built right now, only activates the rotation when another button is clicked, but not when the same button is clicked twice. And that is why I created this repeat button since the beginning. What we want to do now is find a way to put this repeat checkbox into the equation. So I want the cube to re-rotate clockwise whenever I click this repeat button. And the same for the other buttons. For example, I want to click right and whenever I click on this repeat button, I want the right face to be rotated counterclockwise. Let us do that now. What we'll be modifying this time is this section here. We already made sure that the cube's rotations will be activated as soon as I change the select phase button. But what I want now is for the cube's rotation to be also activated when I click this repeat button. And remember that we used this memory node and this comparison node to do it and I told you that there are actually two ways to do it and now I'll show you the second way which involves us creating a manual memory node or something like that. From the Expresso node I will output the repeat information. Let me optimize this and the way it's going to work is that I will first create a constant node change its data type to boolean 
and drag and drop this gear icon into the Expresso editor. And as I have already mentioned in the past, this will create a node whose reference would be this constant node. But what it will also allow us to do is feed information into this constant node, something that the constant node by default doesn't allow you to do. I will feed this repeat node into this value input and then I will duplicate this comparison node and compare again these two values. So what is happening is that we are creating some kind of a loop. The information flows into this input, thus is updating the value of this constant and then we are comparing these inputs together. And what will happen is that for just a fraction of a second, these values will not be equal. And that fraction of a second is the exact moment when we click the repeat button. Let me now test that for you. I will bring a printer console node and connect it to this comparison node and have a look while I click the repeat checkbox. It says false and I refresh the viewport. They are both equal, so the equal node outputs a value of true. As soon as I click it again, it goes back to false and then to true again. So it is the same functionality that we got by using the memory node. Now we have to find a way to combine these two information and get the result in this math multiply node. And the way we are going to do that is by using a boolean node. A boolean node is a node that allows you to do some mathematical logic. To tell you the truth, I almost never remember what these functions do. For example, I know AND or AND means that the Boolean node will output true if both the inputs are true or will output true if only one of the inputs has a value of true. But where I get confused is with these other kind of logic operations, XOR, NAND, NOR, and XOR. And what I usually do is open the help file and read out their explanations. And I think it is this annex OR that we should use. It says, if an even number of input ports are true, the output will be true. Otherwise, the output is false. Anixor performs the reverse operation of XOR. So I will choose Anixor and replace this input here. I will rearrange these nodes somewhat for clear visibility. And previously I forgot to color code this Expresso node here. You have to be consistent in the color chosen. And let me now test what we've done. So I'll hit play, choose the top plus face, click repeat, and it does exactly that. It repeats the last rotation. Let's do it for the other faces. Don't let the fact that all the cubes rotate exactly the same fool you. It is not the main cube that is rotating. Rather, all the little cubes are rotating along the same axis and in the same way, counter or clockwise. The only thing left to do now is create some kind of a mask. What I mean by that? I want to find a way to limit the rotation only to the cubes 
that represent a selected face. So whenever I click top plus, I want top row of cubes to be rotated. And whenever I click right, back or left, I want the corresponding face to be rotated. This is what we'll do next. Create a mask to rotate only the cubes that correspond to the selected faces. Okay, now it's time to talk a little about a somewhat underrated node in Expresso. It is found in the logic group of nodes and is called order. What does it do? Well, the manual says that it orders its two inputs based on their value. What it means, it compares the two inputs. If the first input is greater than the second input, let me pick up a print to console node and we will watch console. If the first input is greater than the second input, the result will be 1. If both inputs are equal, the result will be 0. And if the second input is greater than the first one, the output will be minus 1. How is it useful to us? Well, we can use this node to determine whether a set of cubes that make up a face is positioned in the positive or negative side of a given axis. Let us take, for example, the top row. The top row is positioned in the positive side of the y-axis. The bottom side is positioned in the negative side of the y-axis. The right side is found in the positive side of the x-axis. And in return, the left side is positioned in the negative side of the x-axis. So the order node gives us results in a range from minus 1 to 1. If we get a condition node, the switch input of the condition node accepts only values in the range from 0 and up. There is no way to feed a negative value into the switch input, at least for the condition node to work properly. So what do we do with the results that come out from the order node with a negative value? Well, we will use a little workaround. First, what do we want to order? We want to order the positions for every little cube. Let me do that. We will read the position from this hierarchy node. We will get out an object node. And instead of bringing out global matrix or local matrix and then extracting the position information out of it, Expresso gives us a way to output just the local position and it's found under the coordinates menu and the position sub menu. We don't need the global position, we just need the position, which in this case is the local position. So we have the position and based on the selected faces we want to check for a certain axis. So we convert this position vector into reals. And this way we can get access to the x, y and z axis of the position separately. Let me duplicate this Expresso node here. And instead of reset, I will output select face. I will now create a long condition node, the switch will be this select face menu. And if you remember, the select face menu has 12 inputs. So this condition node will have 12 inputs as well. It by default comes with two inputs, so we'll add the rest. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Let me optimize it. And the order in which we'll connect these channels will be the same order 
as in this select face menu. Now the first ones to check are the top and bottom. For the top and bottom what we will check if they are in the positive or negative side is the Y axis. So we'll connect the Y channel into the first four inputs of the condition node. Then comes the right and left sides and for these sides we will check for each cube if it is on the positive or negative side of the X axis. Let me connect the output of the X axis into second set of inputs of the condition node and last for the front and back sides will check whether they are in the positive or negative side of the Z axis. So the rest of the inputs will be connected to the Z channel. And the output of this condition node will go into the first input of the order node. What will they be compared to? They will be compared with another condition node. Let me duplicate this one. The switch will be again modified with the select face menu from the expresso node. And what do we want to compare? For the top side we want to compare whether it's found on the positive or negative side of the y-axis. So for the top let's compare it to the positive side of the y-axis and for the bottom we'll compare them with the negative side of the x-axis. In this analogy for the right and left which are the next menu items, we will compare whether the cubes are found on the positive side of the x-axis or the negative side of it. And for the front and back side of the cubes, we will check whether the little cubes are found on the negative side of the z-axis for the front and positive z-axis for the back face. Let me now connect this output to the input of the order node and let us check what we have done already. Where is the print to console? Well, I deleted it. Let me get another instance of this node. Clear the console and let us check the results for the top plus face. Let me connect it again. Okay, now we see for the top face, there are only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 cubes that are in the positive side, which means there are 9 cubes whose y axis is greater than 1. Why 1? Because for the top side, we are comparing the value of the y axis to 1. And these are exactly these faces let us choose the left plus face. Connect the output here. Disconnect it. Okay. Now there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Sorry. The left plus face is in the negative side of the X axis. So we are comparing the position of these little cubes to a minus 1 value. And as we see, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 cubes whose x value is actually smaller than minus 1. And these are exactly these left plus faces. But we are not done yet. What we need to do with this order node result we need to compare it, let's take a compare node, we need to compare the results with one of these values. So we can get a 0 or 1 result out of this order node that can easily be fed into a condition node. Let me again get a print to console node and print it out. This true or false 
results can easily be fed into a condition node and in this case let me use the universal adapter node so we can see the results in zero or once and you see now that there are one two three four five six seven eight nine cubes with a result of one and the rest is zero the cubes whose matrices will be updated are the ones with a result of one the rest will not be updated and this way we can build a mask for the cubes transformation let us now create a condition node its data type will be matrix the switch will be driven by this result we will feed the local matrix of the cubes into the first input and this result into the second input let me rearrange the nodes I did this so the reset state button is the last in the chain and let us check what we have done I will hit play and change the face selections okay and as you see it is exactly what we wanted We can also reset and start again. Okay. So it's done. Now let me make some rearrangements to the nodes so we can review what we've done so far first of all we created this reset state then we created this custom timer after that we created a custom rotation matrix and then we created this part of the setup to create a mask that will decide which of the cubes will be rotated by this rotation matrix and the last part in the chain is this reset state button that we can use to put the cube back into its default state we are ready now for animation and that is what we will do next Now it is time to show you how to animate this Rubik's Cube puzzle. First of all, I'm going to create a keyframe for the on-off switch. Move away 10 frames from the beginning. Turn the setup on, add a new keyframe. Also, I will create a keyframe for the select face menu. Move 10 frames away. You would ask, why exactly 10 frames away? Well, the distance between keyframes is not very important. What is important is that this distance is larger than the transition length. That would break the setup. So I will change face again and add a keyframe. Here and there I can use the repeat button. Add a keyframe for the repeat. Again, let's change faces. Change face again, repeat. Okay, I think that's enough. And last, I will turn off the setup again. 
let me change the scene duration to 150. Make sure the animation mode is turned to simple. Go to the first frame and play forwards. All fine and good. And the good thing about this kind of setup is that it works even when the time goes in reverse. So I will now play the timeline in reverse and I hope that the cube will go to the default state when the timeline hits zero. Yes, that's it. I can even do the reverse of this if I now go to the end of the timeline, hit the reset button, and now when the time goes backwards, the cube will scramble itself, and whenever I hit play forwards, the cube will go back to its reset state. Maybe you do not want the animation to start at the beginning of the timeline, so that is what this on and off switches for. So let's say I have a longer timeline, 250 frames long, and I want the animation to start at the frame 50 because you have some other kind of animation in your scene and you want the cube's animation to start at 50. That is no problem. The same goes if the timeline goes backwards. So that's all for the animation part and that completes the setup of a Rubik's Cube. The next part of the series will I will show you how to set up a Pyraminx. That is another type of puzzle very similar to the Rubik's Cube but it's slightly more complicated to set up. The reason is because unlike the Rubik's Cube the Pyraminx does not have a single axis around which the pieces rotate. If you only want to create and have a Rubik's Cube, you can stop here. But I can tell you that the setup that I will show you next, although slightly more complicated, is a more universal setup because you can even build a Rubik's Cube using that setup. So thank you for watching. Don't hesitate to leave your comments on the comment section and please share this video so that the word spreads out. Thank you again.